The Appalachian Mountains and their cultures are the constant butt of jokes throughout the rest of the country. It is one reason I don't use words like hillbilly and backwoods in mixed company. It often sparks an odd distancing effect that horror film buffs call urbanoia, the paranoia of city dwellers about rural or wild places and the people who live there. This does little to instruct outsiders about the true nature of the culture or to elevate the shame of so many of the region's inhabitants. That self-loathing finds its historical expression in mass migration out of the region, in pained and painful memoirs, and in a lost generation of meth-addicted people. Appalachia has long been a region of subsistence, creativity, and resilience, however. As the long toxic extraction industry that is coal mining and its affiliates leaves the region it has despoiled for over a century, a vacuum forms. As the harsh and powerful Protestant religions loosen their grip on the people, and those old-time adherents die off, it creates space, making an opportunity for something new, and frankly, healthier, to ride through this land of forest and smoke. I'm your host Jason, and you are listening to the Esoteric Book Club. Welcome back, Goblins! This is the first episode of the second season of the Esoteric Book Club. Due to my release schedule, following the full moon and new moons, the first episode of the Esoteric News Briefs has already been released. In that episode, I got to talk to author Morgan Daimler, so check it out if you haven't already listened. What you heard in today's introduction was a selection from the book Roots, Branches, and Spirits, The Folkways and Witchery of Appalachia by H. Byron Ballard. Ballard was born, raised, and still resides in North Carolina. She is senior priestess and co-founder of Mother Grove Goddess Temple and the Coalition of Earth Religions for Education and Support, or Ceres for short. She has presented at the Sacred Space Conference, Southeast Wise Women's Herbal Conference, Glastonbury Goddess Conference, Harvard University, and the University of North Carolina. She is a regular contributor to Sage Woman magazine and has written four books prior to Roots, Branches, and Spirits. This was one of those times where I had a strange inkling about a book and ordered extra copies for the shop where I work. The first print run of this title sold out within days of its release, not just from my store, but across the board. The publisher, Llewellyn, had to scramble to do a second printing in order to keep up with its popularity. As you heard in the introduction, Ballard is a very eloquent author, and, as an Appalachian myself, I find that she was able to fully encapsulate the combination of pride, shame, splendor, and squalor that is the Appalachians. That is what initially drew me into this book. She was writing from within the culture as someone who bore the same regional and cultural weight that I and many of my friends bear. Not only that, But Ballard is cognizant of the larger picture of the region. Large corporations, corporations that exploited this land and its people for generations, are now leaving. In their wake, they have abandoned the citizens and left them with a sense of hopelessness and fear that often results in anger or self-destruction. This book is a way to preserve the past and to inspire the next generation of Appalachians to seek a path that more closely aligns with the land itself. I could tell immediately that Ballard is a folklorist by the way that she approached the story of Appalachia. It is very similar to the way that Dr. Ruth Ann Music and Dr. Patrick Gaynor recorded West Virginia folklore. For those who missed that episode, check out Season 1, Episode 8, Supernatural West Virginia. Ballard seems more closely aligned to Gaynor, though, since she includes music as a large part of Appalachian witchery. The combination of music and witchcraft may seem a bit odd for people unfamiliar with musical charms. Essentially, they are recitations with a set meter that assists in repetitive work. An example is the butter churning song. It goes as follows. Come butter come, cows in the pasture, churn a little faster, come butter come. 
This is a variation of an old English charm known as the Essex charm for the churn. This charm is obviously used to set a pace for a youngster churning butter, but it isn't limited to just the presented verse. It can expand and change based on the surroundings of the one doing the churning. For example, they may add in, Daddy's standing at the gate waiting for his butter cake. It all depends on the creativity of the person singing the charm and how long it takes for the butter to form. This is one of the few instances where the song isn't a church hymn, though. Oftentimes, the songs sung were those that people were most familiar with, so church hymns would have been the most common due to the frequency of their use. In theory, it's not necessarily the words that matter, but the way that the song sets our bodies to a rhythm. These songs can also unify people into a singular, repetitive motion for a task, such as hauling on a rope to lift a log for a barn raising. Think about sea shanties. They may be entertaining, but their purpose is to set sailors into a singular rhythm for the work at hand. All of this is in part one of the book, which covers the geography, history, and evolution of the Appalachians themselves, with a bit of folklore and anecdotes thrown in for good measure. Part two, skills and work, encompasses a larger portion of the book. This is where things diverge a bit from the norm. What you have to be aware of is that this is a book of modern Appalachian witchcraft, not necessarily conjure or folk magic, though there are many aspects of both of those practices mixed in. This is abundantly clear in how the first part of this chapter is organized. The section, Tools, Supplies, and Techniques, is divided up based on the four elements, a practice seen more in modern witchcraft than in traditional folk magic. To most, using the four elements may seem traditional, but in folk magic, especially conjure practices, these delineations are not so structured. Magic systems based on Yoruba beliefs certainly use the elements, but not in this manner. Magic used in Scotch-Irish systems don't even use the four elements format. Celtic originating magic systems, at best, may reference land, sea, and sky, as opposed to earth, air, fire, and water. I'm not saying that what is presented in this book is wrong. I just want to point out that the presented system is more of a modern Wiccan-based magic system than one of Southern-style folk magic. If this was what you're interested in, fantastic. I just don't want listeners to think that the book is something that it's not. The first elemental section listed is that for Earth. This seems to be the foundation of the practice, which thematically makes sense. She talks about grounding in a more accessible way than most magical titles do. She strips it down to its basic component, being barefoot and connecting with the ground that you walk on. Yes, for most of us in the modern age, our feet have become soft. Grounding for any length of time, especially if you are walking while grounding, can be a difficult task at first. As you practice it more, your feet will become tougher and you will be more comfortable walking barefoot for a longer duration. Following the concept of grounding and staying within the theme of Earth, Ballard talks about a uniquely southern magical component, redding. In the north, we think of it in terms of brick dust, that deep red ochre colored powder. In the south, red clay is abundant in the soil, so they don't necessarily have to take a hammer to stonework. She even admits that its use is not traditional where she lives, but it is a component of folk magic that she has adopted into her own practice. She mentions briefly that it has a protective element to it, but doesn't really expand on how it's used. The final aspect of earth that she elaborates on are the mortar and pestle and a variety of stones. Without going into too much detail, she says that a good, sturdy mortar and pestle is essential for many magical preparations. In fact, she mentions its use in the section of Reading. As far as stones go, she mentions a few local stones that are common in her practice, such as mica, garnet, gravel, and river stones. This is one part that seems to be more akin to folk magic, the use of what is around you rather than foreign ingredients. Moving on to the section for air, 
she elaborates on the importance of breathing exercises. This is another part that can be combined with grounding in order to establish a cohesive practice of meditation. What's nice about this format is that you can learn each separately and combine them after you are confident with their use. This is especially noticeable in the tree visualization exercise described in the earth section. Basically, while grounding, you close your eyes and imagine yourself to be a tree. Your feet and toes are roots reaching deep into the earth, finding nourishment, while your head and arms are limbs, drawing warmth from the sun. On its own, this exercise is a good way to center yourself, but combined with breathing techniques, it becomes meditative. Symbolically, feathers are associated with air. This part is a little odd, because rather than elaborate on this concept, she instead tells a story about a device used to scare birds. Picture this. You have a potato on a string. Now jam some feathers into it, so that when you hang it up, it spins in the wind. Apparently, this is a folk device that is used in England to keep birds away from crops. It's a fun anecdote, but I'm not sure it really belongs in this section. Maybe it's here to serve to demonstrate creative uses for feathers? I don't know. Guess what is mentioned in the fire segment? Yeah, you guessed it. Candles. If this is your first book on magical tradition, the few paragraphs about candles is great. It just doesn't really expand on much. The more interesting part is when she talks about the oil she makes to use on candles. She has a blend of herbs that she steeps in oil for a full moon cycle, which she then strains and uses for candle magic. Knowing that process is pretty handy, and frankly, is more interesting than the passage on the safety considerations when using candles. The fire segment also talks about sacred smoke. Now this part I have major issues with. Specifically a single passage, which I will read to you verbatim. Quote, As we continue to refrain from using white sage as a smudge or palo santo as an incense, for cultural as well as environmental reasons, it is good to remember that sacred smoke is used by many cultures for ritual purification, and each culture uses materials that are native to them for this purpose. End quote. Get ready. I'm about to go retrieve my soapbox. Place said soapbox in front of the listening audience, ascend to the box, and speak my piece. I have never seen nor heard one God's damned statement from an indigenous source saying that we should not use white sage. Every single time that it has come up, it has been from a young Caucasian woman on the internet. In fact, in every instance that I have seen or personally engaged in this discussion with actual Native Americans, they have clearly stated that they don't care. What they do feel passionately about is that you use it properly and that you don't pretend that you are performing a sacred Native American ceremony. That is offensive and that is cultural appropriation. If you want to personally use white sage in your own home to accompany your personal rituals, that's fine. If you want to sell tickets to a weekend retreat that includes, quote, an authentic Native American smudge cleansing, well, now we have a problem. Cultural appropriation isn't the personal proper use of an herb that grows in the wild. Cultural appropriation is when multi-million dollar organizations like Sephora try to mass market it in beginner witch kits for tweens. As for Palo Santo, I did a great deal of research into it over a year ago when the rumor began to circulate on the internet that it was endangered. First of all, there are two species of trees that go by the common name Palo Santo. One is indeed endangered. The wood of this tree has a dark, rich orange-brown hue that is very, very noticeable. The other tree species, and the one that most of us recognize, has a yellow-tinted wood and is most certainly not endangered. Oh, but I saw online that they're both listed as an endangered species, you may reply. 
I looked into this, too. What I found is that Bursera graviolens, the species of Palo Santo found in metaphysical shops, is not listed on any international endangered species list, nor is it listed as being at risk. There was a brief time when it first became popular that it was listed by a single country as being at risk, at which time it became illegal to fell live trees. Since then, reforestation projects, often funded by the sale of harvested trees, has brought this species back into stability. In fact, it has been shown that the popularity of this tree species has been responsible for preventing mass clear-cutting of tropical forests. How does that work, you might ask? Because native populations who rely on harvesting and export of Palo Santo are replanting saplings, which gives them extended right of use to the land. As long as the land is in use, it cannot be utilized by cattle ranchers who would clear-cut the forest to make more grazing pastures. So not only is Palo Santo not endangered, but it is instead helping native populations and preventing further deforestation of tropical environments. Ultimately, statements made about the endangered nature and cultural appropriation of these plants are false and are being perpetuated by woke performative allies on the internet. <laughs> I'm calm. I'm good. Everything's fine. Anyway, Ballard makes her own blend from mint, mugwort, and rabbit tobacco. That's basically all she says. She spent more time on her statement about the perceived ethics of sage than she did on her own use of herbs for smoke cleansing. As you can maybe tell, this is where I feel the book starts to go downhill. The section of water is a little more interesting. It talks about the use of dish water, willow water, ditch, stump, and storm waters, as well as two that I've not seen mentioned in other sources, forge water and mill water. Because these are unique materials that seem to be little known in published sources, it would have been nice to have her expand on them a bit. Instead, we get a single paragraph about each type and a few vague suggestions for their use. Largely, the second half of this book seems to suffer in much the same way as I've already elaborated upon. We are given small snippets of broad stroke information, but with very little substance. It feels very clickbaity to me. There's a 28 page chapter on herbs, which covers 24 different herbs, and about half have no more than a single paragraph dedicated to them. Even then, much of that is dedicated to a description of the plant or an anecdote rather than the plant's uses. This is especially prominent when she speaks about certain plants that are toxic if not prepared properly. For example, elderberry. She does note in her section on mugwort that it does have an abortificant effect if taken in large doses, and that sumac has a poisonous look-alike, but she misses warnings that should be present on others, such as Queen Anne's lace having a deadly look-alike, poison hemlock. Yes, the stuff that killed Socrates. What's crazy is that we aren't even to the section dedicated entirely to poisonous plants yet. The section on poisonous plants is three pages long, in which she lists and describes six different plants. That means, at best, each plant gets a half-page description. Let me read you an example. Quote, Foxglove. Digitalis purpurea. Every fairy garden should have great stands of foxglove in the corners and around the little pond. It is an old-fashioned garden favorite and is also the source of digitalis, a heart drug. I use the leaves and flowers as a lure and as a talisman when working with land spirits. End quote. That's it. That's the entire entry on foxglove. Let's ignore the fact that she doesn't list any safe handling directions. Let's just look at it from a magical perspective. 
She says every fairy garden should have this plant in the corners and around the pond. Okay. Why? Why do fairies like this plant? Why place them in the corners? Why place them around the pond? She notes that she uses them both as a lure and as a talisman when working with land spirits. Again, how? Why? How is it both a lure and a talisman? Like I said, this is a frustrating aspect of this book. I would have preferred that she had gone into more detail, both in content and safety precautions, or simply to have left out this section on herbs entirely. I don't want to be terribly down on this book, but I also want to be fair to those who are listening to this podcast. You need to know that yes, there are good sections of this book full of history and what is very clearly an emotional connection to this land that outsiders just don't understand. But it also has its failings as well. In that spirit, let's take a look at what this book does well. I've already talked about how eloquently she describes the Appalachians and its people and their struggles. That part is given. This book also has some unique segments that Ballard calls some witchery. These segments are descriptions of specific spells and or charms that she herself performs. Many of these are unique, or at least seem to be unique to me. One entry talks about her use of candy in spellcraft. Yeah, you heard that correctly. Candy for spellcraft. The good news is that she isn't using any top-shelf candy for this. She's using less desired candy, such as Necco wafers, chocolate coins, and candy pumpkins. Of course, she also uses Swedish fish, which several of my friends rave about, so I can't badmouth them too much. The story behind this practice is rather interesting. Ballard had heard a presentation about a practice in southern India known as Kolam. In Kolam, the lady of the house draws a design using rice flour on the front step of the house or on the sidewalk in front of the home. As the elements and animals slowly consume this design, it brings prosperity to the home. The concept of a consumed spell, or one that is reclaimed by the land, intrigued her, so she tucked the concept away in the back of her mind for later use. Eventually, she developed her first candy spell, the Marshmallow Hex. It seems fairly simple. You take a marshmallow and write the name of the person that you are hexing in pencil on the surface. Then you pierce the marshmallow with sticks and place it somewhere that ants and other small critters can consume it though you want to keep it away from a level that dogs could reach because they may attempt to swallow it whole and would choke on the sticks. She personally recommends placing it in the crook of a tree. It may seem simple, but so is the common freezer spell, where you place a photo of a person in an ice cube tray with water and freeze it. I'm sure several of you are waiting with bated breath for me to describe how to use Swedish fish. Get it? Bated breath? Yeah. Anyway, this one seems to be more of a visualization exercise than an actual spell. It's easier just to read it as it's written. These are the candy I most often recommend to people for connecting with land spirits. They are easy to find and everyone knows what they look like. They come in colors other than red, but we think of them as red. What do you want to catch? A new job? A new place to live? Let each of these fish be a catch that you've reeled in, making your life a little sweeter. And we are right back to one of my primary frustrations with this book. So often, Ballard is excellent about expressing herself and describing the details of what she is attempting to convey. And then other times, you get an entry like this. She says that she recommends people use this to connect with land spirits. Perfect. Awesome. How do you go about doing that? Why does this work? Isn't it a bit odd that spirits of the land enjoy a candy that is shaped like an aquatic animal? She says they're used for attraction. I guess the color red makes a little bit of sense here, but what do you actually do? Do you hold a single fish and imagine that it is your new job before you devour it? 
that seems to be the gist of it, but without directions, I can't really be certain. Look, by now it's very clear that I have mixed feelings about this book. The narrative sections are excellent. The magical sections often reveal unique aspects to Ballard's craft. That said, these glimpses are just that, fleeting views. Broad swaths of this book left me wanting more information about specific details, and other sections made me uncomfortable with the lack of safety precautions. Oftentimes, I felt like I was reading a book of related essays with individual sections thrown in to create an overarching narrative. As for the magical practices themselves, I felt like I was being taught Wicca with a southern flair, and maybe a dash of conjure mixed in. It's really hard to describe. So much of it has to do with the land itself and the historical way that people interacted with it in the past, but then you also have sections divided into the four elements, which, outside of classical philosophy and alchemy, is largely a neo-pagan practice. Do I recommend this book? I don't know. I'm largely conflicted. I have not read a work from someone who truly understands the culture as I have experienced it outside of this book and a select few others. If you are an Appalachian, you will find yourself nodding along to the entire first half. If you're not, it eloquently conveys how we see ourselves and experience life in these mountains. Beyond that, I found the information to be very cursory, and so very often I was hoping that Ballard would expand a bit more on what ultimately comes across as a throwaway comment. It's like watching a beautiful bird fly quickly past your window, but being unable to see what species it was. I guess ultimately, it's entirely up to you whether or not you pick up this book. Some of what I've spoken about here may intrigue you, and in that case, I encourage you to read it for yourself. Some of you may be looking for more depth, and while this book is well written and easy to read, I feel that it was wanting in the detail that I had hoped it would have within its pages. Esoteric Book Club can be found on Instagram, Facebook, Patreon, and on the web at esotericbookclub.org. Shout out to my patrons who help make this show possible, especially those pledging at the elemental tier, such as Samantha Shaver. You too can join the ranks of loyal goblins for as little as $1 per month. Your contribution helps pay server costs, purchase reading materials, and most importantly, it provides me with coffee. Intro and outro music is from the song Fight, Don't Fight, and is courtesy of Sarah Rudy and her band Hello June. You can find their work on Bandcamp.com or at WeAreHelloJune.com. The music played during my brief moment of insanity is entitled On Hold For You by Kevin MacLeod. His work can be found at IncompTech.FilmMusic.io. As always, links to the book and music are in the show notes. So, until next time, remember, stay weird. Alright, it is time for you extra special weirdos. Tonight, we are taking a look at a booklet entitled Throwing the Bones, How to Foretell the Future with Bones, Shells, and Nuts by Catherine Yaronwood.